Thank you, guys. It's really nice to see so many people interested in static analysis here. And uh, this year is a special year for PyLint because it is uh, its 12th birthday. So, yeah, uh, basically it's uh, the oldest static analysis tool in Python that is still maintained, which is really nice. So, in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, PyLint's history and we'll go through a detour in static analysis and uh, we'll see where, where that goes. So, what is this lint thing I'm talking about? Basically, uh, lint is like a tool you use to analyze your code in order to find bugs or potential uh, errors or style checks or stuff like that. But uh, saying this about PyLint is an understatement since it can detect a lot more than uh, uh, a normal linter. It's also a style checker which enforces pep8 uh, rules. Uh, it's a structural analyzer looking at your uh, classes and at your special methods and checking if they are implemented correctly. And it's also a type checker. So, PyLint works by using a technique called static analysis, which is basically the act of um, analyzing code without actually executing it. Um, and if you don't use static analysis right now, you should use it. Uh, you should use any other tool, not just PyLint, uh, because it can really help you in your day-to-day -day job. Um, for instance, you can use static analysis if you have a lot of tests and it takes a lot of time to run and you just want to check that uh, uh, th there are no obvious errors in your code or stuff like that. Or if you have big legacy systems which don't have test, uh, tests at all. Uh, in fact, as uh, my first job experience, uh, I worked in a company where we have a lot of, of big legacy systems, but they didn't have tests. So uh, using static analysis was uh, paramount for, for checking that every, everything works before going in, uh, in production. And you can use it as a form of doing reviews. Well, of course, it's not equivalent to a manual review, but it's better than no review at all. Right. So, um, here's a piece of code which uh, has a couple of problems, uh, and I'm going to show how PyLint detects this kind of stuff. Uh, for instance, if you can see, I, I imported OS, but I didn't use it across my program. And I also define a variable which is just there, it's not used. Uh, of course, this, uh, this is not a problem per se, but uh, it leads to ugly code or unmaintainable code or stuff like that. And more important is uh, this block here from line eight to 10. Uh, let's, let's just say that I invented that code incorrectly and that code will now will not run because it's uh, after an array statement so basically it's useless code. Also, at line 10, I intended to call the execute method, but I didn't, so that's also a problem. And as you can see down, down here, PyLint detects this kind of stuff and properly emits that there is something fishy in your code. Okay. But uh, we can detect uh, m more serious bugs than this like uh, using undefined variables or trying to access members that don't exist or calling functions that aren't functions like calling an integer. And as you can see here, PyLint detects this kind of stuff and it's really nice for a static analysis tool to tell you that you, you made a mistake in your program. Um, and uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, before, PyLint is also a structural analyzer, checking that uh, your special methods are properly implemented or that your classes uh, are written correctly. And in this case, the Dunder exit method uh, needs three parameters in order to work properly. And uh, PyLint detects this kind of stuff. It, it emits that, uh, that warning, right? Um, another nice uh, error that PyLint can detect is this one. Basically, here I have uh, a function and then I have an if statement with, uh, with func as, as a condition, conditional for, for the if statement. And what I intended here to do initially was to 
call func, but I forgot to write the, uh, the parents. And uh, this statement will always be true. And that if statement, if statement, if branch will always be taken. So if you write this for this, uh, for this piece of code, you might, um, how to say, uh, if you write this for this, for this piece of code, you might overlook, overlook it. If you if you didn't test it properly, so Pylint can can help you in in this kind of situation as well. Okay, uh, take a couple of moments to figure out what's the problem here. If you know the answer, yell really really loud. Anyone? Sorry? Var is being changed in the loop. Var is being changed in the loop. So what's the output of this code? Uh, this <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, that's it. Uh, ba sorry. Basically what we did is we created a closure here and uh, var w was looked up into parent scope when, uh, when called. It ah, doesn't work. And var was uh, was um, uh, looked up in the parent scope and called. And for this uh, particular case, the parent scope was the least comprehension, at least on Python 3. So uh, when the for loop was executed and callable was called, basically the var was the last value from the for loop, which was nine. So that's a bug. And uh, if you try to do a review, you might have missed this stuff. And Pylint can help you. Help deal with this kind of situation, okay? Um, a little bit of uh, history about Pylint. Uh, it was created in 2003 by a French uh, company called Lo Logilab. Uh, they used to maintain it for a while, for 10 years, but uh, now they are not so involved anymore. In fact, they are not involved anymore in Pylint's development. Um, even though many still think that, about about them, which is wrong. Um, I know that Google uses uh, a modified version of PyLint uh, internally for their use cases uh, because uh, they had an, uh, uh, a maintainer for uh, gpylint that was also a maintainer for PyLint and they used to push upstream a lot of uh, changes. Um, and some statistics, uh, according to ochloch.net, we have over 30,000 uh, 30, lines of code, uh, which is pretty big, but not big enough because we, we can detect all the problems in your code. Um, and unfortunate, unfortunately, uh, Pylint is GPL licensed because uh, GPL was really cool back then in 2003. It still is? <laughs> yeah. Um, and here's my involvement with Pylint, basically, um, I started working on it in uh, 2013 when Pilot 1.0 was released and uh, up to Pilot uh, 1.3 I became a committer, a maintainer, the only maintainer and uh, the guy that pushes uh, the thing forward. Um, I'm planning to release Pilot 2.0 in uh, 2016 if um, my time allows it and uh, I'm going to have some uh, um, advanced techniques in it uh, it's still uh, uh, right now uh, uh, pretty advanced, but it's going to be even more advanced than that. Um, basically, uh, I'm going to use a technique called abstract interpretation, where I'm going to basically interpret statically your code, not actually executing, but statically. Um, and also, I'm going to add support for PAP 484, uh, what uh, uh, Guido's talk was about, and uh, changing the things internally, like having control flow graphs and having a symbolic execution engine for, for it. Yeah. Right. Uh, and at this point, you might ask yourselves, okay, this is cool, but how it works and why does it work statically? Um, first of all, Pylint uh, is split in, actually in two components into real checker, which is PyLint, and its inference engine and the component that understands Python, which is Asteroid. Um, following the general 
pattern of building a linter. Basically, we're using abstract syntax trees. Uh, even though our abstract syntax trees are augmented with a couple of uh, functionalities that help uh, help us in uh, in building the inference engine. Um, and internally, Astrade uses the built-in module AST, which kind of looks like this when using it. You import parse and you give it a string and uh, from there you get an abstract syntax tree, which basically looks like this. So if you can see at the top of the tree we have a lambda, which has uh, a couple of arguments and the blue, the blue stuff out there, the blue thingy is, is a node and uh, the rest of them are just uh, uh, attributes of those nodes. So as you can see, it's pretty structured and you can, just by looking at it, you can reason about code. Right. Even though AST is great, it's built in, we don't have to write our own parser, it's not perfect because uh, um, the, it's not backwards compatible, not even uh, for uh, minor versions of Python releases like 3.4 and 3.5. Basically, they, they are going to add new nodes or remove nodes or change things out there. And uh, Asteroid strives to be a uh, backward compatible uh, wrapper over AST that you can use for Python 2.7 till Python 3.5 and as well for PyPy or Jiton or any other interpreter which supports abstract syntax trees. And the API is quite similar with the, with the AST. As you can see, it doesn't differ too much. We have basically the same functions. Yeah, so if you're using AST right now and you want something more capable, you, you could use Asteroid. Um, and as I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, our Asteroid nodes are quite similar with the one from AST but we augment them with a couple of capabilities uh, specific for, for our purposes. Uh, like in this example, for instance, uh, you can actually retrieve the parent of a, of a node and you can, you can walk up in the tree starting from one node. Also, you can walk down by using the get, get children method, right? Also, uh, you can retrieve the lexical scope of a variable. Um, for instance, in this particular case, the lexical scope of foo is the function where, where it is defined. And uh, down there at the list comprehension, basically I'm doing foo for foo in range 10. And uh, the scope of, uh, of foo, at least on Python 3, is the list comprehension itself. So foo doesn't leak outside. Yeah, and PyLint can actually know this kind of stuff and Astroid. Right. Um, some nodes are augmented even more or more than that. Uh, like in this example, we have a couple, uh, a couple of classes and um, we're using a meta class, we're using ABC, ABC meta, and we're defining some slots for, uh, for our class and um, yeah. Let's see what Pylint can do, what Asteroid can do with this code. So uh, we can retrieve the slots of the class using the slots method or the meta class using the meta class method or using the MRO method, we, we, we could retrieve the method resolution order of your classes, which is actually the method resolution order when uh, running Python over that, over that script or, or over that class, which is nice. Um, but the most important uh, part about uh, Asteroid is not the AST itself, but the capability of doing inference. Basically, inference means the act of resolving what a node really represents. Like if you have a name and that name represents something like a variable or a function call, you want to infer that and you want to see what's at the end of the, of the tree for that particular node. Um, our nodes basically implement the Python semantics. For instance, the uh, call func inference rule will, will be uh, the return values of the call func. Or uh, for uh, least, uh, least comprehensions, 
its inference rule would be the actual list that uh, is returned when evaluating the list comprehension. Uh, and our inference also does some partial abstract interpretation, but uh, it's partial because it's not working uh, for all the, the cases in your code. Right, and in this particular example, uh, we have a function which adds um, two values, the argument, um, and as you can see in this particular case, when in inferring what this function actually returns, uh, in fact, when inferring what's the result of the function call, Astrid knows that it's 48, because 24 plus 24, it's 48. Yep. This is a more complex example uh, involving binary uh, operators. Uh, and if you know, mm, the rules uh, of binary operators in Py uh, Python goes like that. If you have uh, two different objects and you try to add them, first uh, uh, the dunder add method of the left hand side will be called. Uh, and if that doesn't return not implemented, then uh, I think the um, right hand side uh, object, no, no, uh, I think that uh, uh, the dunder r add method of the right hand side object will be called. Um, and in this particular example, we're having in the left hand side a super type, which is A. As you can see, A is a super type for B because uh, B uh, has as its base class A. And in, in the uh, right hand side, we have B, which is a subtype of A. And the rules are a little bit different in this particular case because um, if the semantics would be the same as for, for the uh, different uh, classes uh, rule, then um, the first rule, uh, then the first method, A, uh, a add, under add, will always be called, which is wrong. And in this particular example, what will happen is that first the uh, dunder r add method of b will be called, and in this particular example, it returns not implemented, so it will fall back to the other one, which is a uh, add the dunder add method from a. And if you do the calculations, you can see that asterisk is right. Uh, the result of that operation is actually 45. Now, um, Asteroid is great, PyLint is great, but they can't really understand your code. Uh, I mean, they can't really understand uh, your full code. So we have to deal with this kind of situation. And um, we provi we're provide we uh, providing uh, a couple of APIs that could help you, like uh, having node transforms. Basically, we're with, with a node transform, we can modify a part of the AST to be some, something else, like you have a function call, and instead of that function call, you want to do inlining like, and replacing the AST node with uh, the result of the function call or anything you'd like. And we can do that with this API. Basically, that API is a function which should accept one parameter, that parameter being the ori original node, and should return either the node modified or a new node. And you just register that function uh, with an internal manager, it's an implementation detail, but anyway, you just register your transform function and when doing asteroid.parse, that uh, transform function will be called for, uh, for that particular type of node. Uh, in this example, I'm registering a transform for the class node and also you can apply a filter function because you don't actually want to change all class nodes in your code. Maybe you want to change something in particular. And as you can see uh, there, I'm just uh, giving it uh, filter functions for filtering any other class that it's not six add meta class. Right. Um, the same thing can be used for inference rules because at some point really you want to have different 
uh, inference semantics than the Python, the Python offers you. So using the same API, you can, you can provide a custom inference rule for, I don't know, you want to infer list comprehensions differently or you want to infer function calls differently. So you're using this inference, uh, inference rule and you're changing basically the semantics of Python uh, in your AST. And we're eating our own dog food in this example, uh, not in this example, we're eating our dog food with inference rules because we have inference rules for built-ins as I'll show you immediately. Um, basically, with inference rules, uh, we are understanding existence, is subclass, uh, we are understanding get utter, has utter, um, type, callable, list, set, whatever. Uh, we are understanding, not in particular with inference rules, uh, binary arithmetic operations, really, really good uh, logical operators or uh, comparisons. Um, also, we're understanding context managers and list set, string indexing, slicing, whatever. Yeah. Um, as uh, earlier, take a couple of moments to see where are bugs in this particular code. There should be like three bugs, but if you can find more, join piling steam. Also, if you know the answer, yell really loud. And as a hint, when, uh, how super works. Basically, uh, the first argument of super uh, specify, no, the, uh, uh, le, uh, the last argument of super specifies the object for, uh, from which the method resolution order will be retrieved. And in this, sorry? Yeah, that's good. Because in that particular case, uh, super C and self would, would be, uh, the method resolution order in this particular case, uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, super C self will, will call uh, B because uh, a doesn't have boo, yeah, and uh, it's multiple, uh, multiple uh, cooperative inheritance, if I'm not mistaken, and B boo will be called, and B boo doesn't accept uh, two arguments. Anyone? Uh, yeah, the, uh, there's no spa, and there is a foo. Sorry, sorry, there, uh, there are too many voices. One at a time. Foo is not callable, exactly. Uh, so, uh, Python detects this stuff because Asteroid knows Python really well. Uh, and as you can see, what, what Python says, there are too many positional arguments at line 14, which is actually true. Um, foo is not callable. Of course, because foo is an integer. And uh, super v has no spam member, which is actually true because it's spam, not spam. Yeah. Uh, here's a more complex example of asteroid capabilities. And as you can see here, asteroid understands uh, list indexing, understands has utter, callable, get utter. And at that particular line where math is retrieved, what will happen is that has utter call will return true because A has the method uh, called mat and uh, A mat is callable and um, get utter from, uh, get mat uh, from A will return the mat object. So it will be like true and true and A dot mat and uh, in this particular case, the last value which is also true will be returned. So mat will be A dot mat. And then uh, the context manager is invoked and um, the context manager will return real func which has no argument whatsoever and we're going to call that and Pylint will say that, hey, you use too many positional arguments in your, in your method call, you should change that. Yeah, so this is kind of stuff that uh, Asteroid knows about Python code and, uh, uh, and 
Filing knows, knows about it as well. Yep. Um, I don't know, I'm going really fast or how much time do I have? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Filing is not so complicated. Asteroid is uh, the most complicated thing. Um, basically, it's like a fancy walker of the AST and uh, it has a couple of patterns, uh, more than a couple, because uh, Pilot can detect uh, almost 180 uh, type of errors or verifications. Um, and basically, we, uh, we, are, we are using the visitor pattern to visit each node, because that uh, pattern really decouples your data structures from your algorithms. Um, and a small example of how visit, uh, visitor pattern works. Uh, let's say we implement in uh, our own checker visit call func. Um, and in this particular example, we're importing collections and uh, we're um, uh, obtaining the default attribute from collections. There's no default attribute in collections, by the way, it's default dict. And what will happen is that Visit get author will be called with the with the node, which will be the get author node. Um, afterwards, we'll uh, infer what that node really represents. I mean, what the par a parent of the statement really represents. The parent will be uh, the name, the name collections, and we need uh, to infer it because we should know what that node represents at the end of the AST. Afterwards, we're, uh, we're calling uh, the get author method with the result from the inference, and if that doesn't raise uh, any error, such as not found that the collections has default, uh, to default attribute, else uh, we're going to emit a no member error, um, but before that we're going to have uh, a couple of uh, filters, like uh, it's the owner is a mixing class because you might not have that attribute in the mixing class, or I don't know, uh, the owner is a class with unknown bases, like bases from extension modules, and we, we can't really understand extension modules, by the way. Yeah, um, I'll go really fast from now on, because I don't have much time left. Um, basically, uh, abstract interpretation will have a pi link for, for this kind of code, uh, in this particular uh, example, uh, the Dunder dict is updated with the dictionary of, I don't know what kind of uh, arguments will be passed. And uh, at line five, we're, we, we will call uh, some arguments set in Dunder in it or whatever other attribute, and that attribute might not exist. And um, what happens right now is that Pilot says, hey, you don't have that attribute, but we're actually having that attribute because we just inserted it at line two. So that's what abstract interpretation is going to fix because it will just interpret every line, every logical line in, in your code and it will know at the end what side effects each line had. Okay, um, we have multiple type of checkers and uh, errors uh, such as conventions for Pepe rules, uh, refactorings, um, various warnings which aren't necessarily bugs in your code uh, and actual bugs like um, like no member or not callable, things like that. And we have two types of checkers, AST based and uh, token based. The token based checkers are for, I don't know, um, a line is too long or uh, bad uh, indentation or other similar examples. Um, Pilot has a, a really vibrant community. There are a lot of uh, uh, external packages for improving inference, for improving Pilot checkers out there. Uh, you could write your own if you want to. Uh, as, uh, the problem is that um, they are pure Python, so you, you need to write Python code in order to have a custom checker. Uh, yeah, uh, it comes to, with a couple of features. Uh, extra features like you could generate U U UML diagrams from your code or you, can, you could spell check your doc strings or comments. You, uh, these are uh, disabled by default. Or uh, you could use the Python, port, uh, Python 3 porting checker, which is a checker when, when activated, 
um, all other checkers are disabled and it will emit stuff that it's not going to work in Python 3 anymore. Uh, like um, using remove syntax or uh, remove built-ins or special methods or my favorite is using map filter or reduce in non-iterable contexts. As you can see in this uh, particular example, on Python 3 map uh, is uh, lazy evaluated and it, uh, in this particular example download URL will never be called because uh, at least on Python 3 because you should evaluate it first. Yeah, it, it will return a generator, stuff like that. Um, okay. Oh, there are a lot of similar tools like PyFlex, MyPy, um, PyChecker. PyChecker basically is the forefather of PyLint. Um, uh, and uh, I should say a couple of things. Even PyChecker is now defunct and dead for a couple of years. It was way more advanced than many of static analysis tools that exists currently in Python. Um, as you can see in this example, uh, we are unpacking uh, three items in two variables, or we are having a constant check, or uh, we're catching an exception, which is not really an exception, true. And PyFlex, as you can see, detected almost nothing, uh, while Py PyChecker detected all, all of these errors. Yeah, there's also Jedi and MyPy. Okay. Yeah, uh, one final note is that users, at least a part of them, actually expects this kind of code to be understood. But really, that's not actually possible. So if you want static analysis tools to understand this, just don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and this is basically the future of uh, PyLint. Uh, we'll have PyLint 2.0 next year. We'll have flu uh, full flow control analysis, uh, better data model like understanding descriptors or um, having the proper attribute access logic. It's not the same uh, in PyLint as uh, it is in Python. And uh, I'm interested in bringing more contributors into the project. And uh, my final slide is, uh, hey, what your uh, talk title is uh, how do I stop worrying and start loving the bugs and so on. Uh, well, PyLint helps if, you, if you're going to use it and if you're going to write as many tests as possible. So use PyLint. Thank you. Have we got any questions? Or oh, many questions? Yeah, there is one question there. Uh, hi, I actually oh. have a comment or a word of caution and a question. Yeah. Uh, the comment is, if you are going to start Pylint, it will take you some time to configure it to make it shut up about things which don't interest you, but it is well worth the time to do so. Yeah. Um, and the question was, how did you get into um, this kind of um, parsing Python and ASTs? And I mean, I tried to write Pylint plugins because there isn't really much um, documentation for Pylint and Destroy, they found it very hard to get into this topic. Um, I was a user of Pylint before, and uh, it had a, a bug, like uh, it didn't detect uh, stuff, like uh, it didn't detect unba unbalanced tuple unpacking, like unpacking three items into two items, and um, I had a bug in production with that stuff, and I just wanted Pylint to, hey, tell me about this. So I implemented that check and I started from there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, one other question. Uh, what are your thoughts about PyLama? Uh, PyLama? Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, is a wrapper over, over multiple check, uh, over multiple linters like PyLint and Flake 8. Yeah, so it just takes PyLint and other yeah, stuff. I, I and never use it actually. No? Ah, okay. <laughs> More questions? There's one here. 
I'm not sure what it is. Can you be more visible? Here. At the front, okay. okay. Hello, so regarding the, the, the first question, uh, the most common complaint, complaint about PyLint is that uh, the, it has too, too, too many checks active, so maybe uh, what if it, there will be like some sort of configuration wizard that will show you examples and will ask you, do you want this or not? Yeah, that yeah, would be cool. That would be nice to have, but uh, I don't have time to write it myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Uh, that's the question. Is there a sprint on PyLint? Yeah, there is. There is Saturday and Sunday. Thank you. And can you join if you're a beginner? Sorry? Can you join to the sprint if you're a beginner? Yeah, of course. Great. More questions? All right. I think it's fair enough. Um, okay. Thank you again, Claudie.